Oh, yes. A very, very good morning to you all. It's interesting not hearing those good mornings back, but very good morning, everybody. Welcome to Confetti's Industry Week 2021. We have an amazing lineup prepared for you guys this year. I'm really, really excited uh, to kick off this week's events today. During Industry Week, we have our hashtag IW21 competition where the post with the most has the opportunity to win a prize. So guys, get involved. If you've got any questions during your talks, guys, use the Q&A function through Zoom, and we will get to those questions at the end of the talks with our panelists. So guys, to kick off, our first guests are very, very special to me, uh, specifically and especially one of those guests who is a Confetti FDSE Games Technology graduate from 2013. Or is it 2012? I don't quite remember. I think it's 2013. Um, he is accompanied by his esteemed colleagues, all of whom work for AAA games company Ubisoft. It is my pleasure, guys, to introduce to you Nick, Zoe, and Emmanuel. Hi, everyone. Hello. <laughs> Hello. Hey, guys. Hey, everyone. Good morning. Awesome stuff. Handing over to you guys. It's all yours. The floor is yours, guys. Okay. Uh, I'll go first. So, uh, obviously, my name's Nicholas Starkey. I'm from the UK. I also, as Jin, uh, Jin has mentioned, I studied uh, confetti uh, as well. Uh, I joined the games industry in about 2015 on a small project called Farana um, as a uh, development tester at the time. And I did that for about three years until moving to a project assistant on the formerly known uh, Uplay, now Ubisoft Connect. Uh, and I've been there for about two years now. So I'll hand it over to, uh, I think, Emma or Zoe, whichever one wants to take it. <laughs> okay, I think I'll take it. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Emmanuel. Uh, I'm from Costa Rica. And I joined Ubisoft uh, two years ago, actually. My first uh, project was a, a brief uh, collaboration in For Honor. Uh, that's what I met Nick. We worked there for some four months and then I was uh, moved to Rainbow Six Siege. Uh, I've been working there for almost two years now as a user interface programmer. And uh, yeah, especially super happy and, and excited to be here now. So, Mike, Mike. Uh, thank you. <laughs> That's a great start. <laughs> well, I'm Zoe. Um, and yeah, I'm hailing in from Manchester. Uh, I only just joined Ubisoft like just under about two years ago, uh, the end of uh, 2019. And I joined uh, a Nick's team of uh, formerly Uplay, now Ubisoft Connect. Uh, prior to that, though, uh, I've spent quite many years uh, with another gaming company that you might have heard of called uh, Blizzard. <laughs> uh, I guess we'll move on to the presentations. Uh, so I can launch that first. Uh, let me share my screen. And can someone just tell me when they see it? It's all working fine. Yep. Okay, cool. My camera seems to seems to have, be having a fit and dying on me. <laughs> Please work. Okay, um, so uh, I'm going to go through my journey within uh, Ubisoft um, to, uh, from and what I've done so far. So it's going to cover um, uh, if it changes. There we go. So it's going to cover uh, two parts basically. My project on Ferrana. Uh, and as me being a test tester on Frontier, and also the second part is going to cover uh, me being a project assistant on Ubisoft Connect. So it looks like my camera is actually physically dying on me at the moment, but let's see if it can hold up. Um, so uh, Frontier. So just a quick run through of Frontier. Um, it's an action adventure fighting game. Uh, within one year after launch, it had 15, over 15 million people play the game. And fun fact, it was released in 2017 on Valentine's Day. Uh, so that's, that's a good surprise. Um, just go through exactly, so what is dev testing? 
so dev testing, uh, as, as Google may put it, uh, dev testing is uh, development testing or dev test is an approach in software development that aims to bring development and testing phases closer together. So what exactly does that mean? So a lot of you may know what uh, a game tester or QC or QA sort of is. Um, uh, dev testing is sort of the front line defense before it reaches that uh, stage. So to put that into sort of a picture view, uh, let's say you have a programmer, they will send a change list or a version to the uh, dev tester. What the dev tester will then do is they will then pull the latest build of the game, the latest version, which is on a server. They will pull that and they will basically um, mush them together. So the programmer's changes and the latest code will be pushed to get, uh, merged together. And then the dev tester will run through that to ensure that the code works on the latest version of the game, which is available for us. Um, this will be rinse and repeat. So they'll repeat this as many times until the feature is uh, like uh, valid, like uh, with less, not enough, like no bugs in, no bugs present. I mean, when I say no bugs, there will be some bugs present, but it's stable enough that it will go, that it can then be pushed back to uh, the main server which is where everyone will then be pulling that information from. Um, so that would be where QA, QC, um, or other programmers would be pulling that information from would also contain the change, which, uh, which has been tested by the dev tester uh, from that programmer. Um, so some of the uh, main things you're gonna be doing if you are a dev tester is about 50% of the time is gonna be um, actually dev testing the product, let's say, and that's going to be broken down into uh, getting the build to work and also testing the feature itself. A lot of times when uh, you'll get stuff from uh, programmers is either with uh, the dev consoles or the current setup you have on your computer, something may not work with the current build. It's something as simple as having a different type of processor might actually impact uh, whether this build will build or run or not, depending on which department you're getting the uh, dev test from, whether it's if it's engine or graphics or something, you might have an issue depending on the graphics card you have. So it can it can vary a lot. Um, and then the final part is obviously once you actually get the build to work, you're actually going to be doing testing on the build um, to actually ensure that uh, the build works to the specifications of the designer and the programmer, uh, depending on the type of dev test. Um, from there, we usually spend about 25% of our time uh, creating test plans and test cases. So test plans are essentially, um, so the designer will create documentation for, for the programmer to work off. And then we will look at that documentation at the same time. And we will then start to create basically a uh, like a guide or a manual on how to actually test this feature. Um, and we will create that from the design documentation. And it will also be reviewed by the designer to ensure that this, this guide we have follows their, uh, their design they put in. Um, from there, we create test cases. So test cases are actual individual cases, which such as uh, if you press the back button, does the page go back? So you can lead with, I don't know, from 10 to 100 to 1,000 test cases, depending on the feature, um, such as the ranking feature in front of it had a bazillion test cases, basically. There's a million things um, for it. Um, and then from there, uh, one of the big things uh, which we also have is uh, communication between the team, between the dev team itself. So discussing things with your lead, discussing things with the dev testers next to you, uh, especially when the dev test itself is for uh, multiplayer, such as For Honor, you would usually need at least about three people to test it, especially when For Honor was on peer-to-peer -peer and not when it was dedicated servers. Uh, it was much easier to test on dedicated servers than peer-to-peer -peer because it required one less person. And the dev testing team, so specifically on the PC side, uh, was only small. It was only a, like a handful of people, or I think around eight or eight or ten people. It was. So when you're taking three people off of uh, other work, 
just to test one of the tests. It can get quite stressful on the team because there's other other dev tests coming rolling in, which need to be uh, achieved, which would need to be completed. Um, and that, that's to talk to your team. And then also you need to be talking to the programmer a lot of the times as well. Uh, so if you're having issues with the dev tests, like I say, getting the build to work, you're going to be talking to the programmer to ensure that the build um, one is actually so the, that the, the changes that the program has actually done are actually in your build. There's been cases sometimes where people have been dev testing and the, the change list hasn't merged correctly. So the changes the program has done isn't actually in the build and they're essentially testing nothing. They're just testing the, the actual game itself, um, but not testing the uh, direct feature. So that, 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 ha that can become an issue sometimes. Um, so, uh, so there's some uh, so sort of uh, main things in Ferrana, which dev testing, which we did really well, I think. Um, we implemented something called Buddy Up, uh, which was every feature dev test that Ferrana had on the PC side uh, would be tested by at least two people. Um, nothing was ever tested by one person, unless if there was a super rare case, but generally they would always have to be reviewed or tested by multiple people. This was to ensure that the quality was there and that no test, test cases were missed or especially when you're doing um, uh, like destructive testing or uh, you're testing outside of the test cases. So because generally you would follow the test cases to to the T basically, but sometimes you want to test outside of the test cases. You might think of something on the spot which you want to test. Um, explorative testing, that's the word I'm looking for. Um, and also when you're testing the exact same, uh, same feature multiple times, maybe 10, 10 plus times, um, little things which you're used to, which are bugs, can become part of the feature for you. And you actually start to lose track of what's what's sort of right and wrong within the feature. And you have to start looking back between documentation multiple times. Um, uh, so yeah, and then we have um, dev test reports, which was something which we added uh, later after dev testing, uh, after, after we implemented our dev testing workflow within uh, the PC side of Ferrana, because before it was, we would create a, so the programmers would send us an email with things they want us to test. And here's the code basically to download their, their version of the, uh, of the game for them. And we would, before we would just send back, uh, like if it's test passed or test failed, we wouldn't really send any sort of reporting back, but we actually implemented sort of uh, specific checks, uh, which was we would include basically the test cases of what we did. And it was more actually not really for the programmer to ensure because the programmer will see test pass and they'll be happy with that. But if they see test failed, that's when it becomes the most important thing for the programmer. But writing the report for us was actually the most important thing um, because it would ensure that we are testing, we have actually tested certain areas. Um, because like I said, you get very used to testing things with certain types of controllers. Maybe you always have one controller plugged in and you'll get used to testing with that and you may forget to use other controllers completely. Um, so writing the report for us gave us the uh, that sort of trigger in our head to be like, ah, I've tested with this X controller, now I test, need to test with Y controller because I haven't written it down. So this became a very useful tool for dev testers. And finally, automation. So we had a lot of automation across the board with uh, Puna, Montreal, um, and Bucharest were all doing uh, automation. On Germany side in Bluebyte, we weren't doing um, that much automation for honor. I know, I believe the graphics, some of the programming side had automation set up and we're setting it up, but on the dev test side, we started to implement it later and we got some dedicated machines just to run the game for basically 24 seven to ensure we have, we have everything, uh, everything works for a long period of time. And I do remember we found a sound issue which would only be present if you played uh, the game mode breach for 12 hours straight, there would be a sound issue at some point and it would randomly trigger and crash the game. And it was found and fixed because of because of this automation we implemented. And so um, even if it fixes, even if it fixes one bug, it was an important bug. So so that's uh, that's really good. Um, next, I'm going to go on to Ubisoft Connect. Uh, so obviously I was a project assistant on Ubisoft Connect and I cover two two areas within that project assistant role. One is release coordinator um, and also 
I so it's a weird weird um, area which I also cover. It's database it's database management in a sense and workflow management for one of the tools we use. I'll get a bit more into that uh, after in a bit. Um, but first, I'm going to go on to uh, release coordinator. Um, so what exactly is a release coordinator? Well, basically, it does. It says what it basically is. But um, we, my job is to obviously coordinate a release. Uh, but what does that entail? So it entails basically I have to obviously plot a timeline, and I need to make sure that the release of it is on that time uh, within a specific date, and that date can vary based on partners we have, such as internal. Uh, such as managers on the Ubisoft Connect project, but it can also depend on other partners that their managers have within Ubisoft Connect. So it so it chains down and around all over the place. So I need to make sure that the the uh, the managers on our team, when they want to uh, push a feature to the client, they aren't treading on the toes of potentially an external partner uh, for them. Um, we also have to incorporate game teams as well. So game teams might want to do a free weekend or an open beta or something. And we want to make sure that the client isn't doing an update mid, mid of this schedule for them. Because if there's an issue on the client and we can't, we, and it takes us a day to fix it or something, we have to do a hot fix, then potentially a game can't load or there's an issue with the service in the game and it's, it, it impacts, impacts them. And that's the last thing we want we, that Ubisoft Connect uh, the client wants to do is impact any other party which adds the connect to it because the Ubisoft Connect, um, th um, let's say, organization is made up of many, many teams and they all talk to each other uh, and all have to work in a synchronized way in order to get things done. And the client release is a very important one because, for example, if the store team want to release uh, something for the store, which requires an update from the client, then we need to update the client before the store team are going to want their stuff live. And then we also need to make sure that it operates with game teams. Um, it's not, push, uh, it's not, it's not um, affecting any game team releases. We also have service releases as well. So to add something else to the mix, we, um, we have service releases, which might be a backend service, which the client needs and has to go in before the client. Um, so we have stuff which has to go in before the client and then we also potentially have to have things which uh, are ready after the client. So it's it gets it can get really you basically get like ten dates and have to juggle them all at once. Um, and then what I try to do is I try to block out uh, two days before and two days after of where nothing where the client doesn't intersect with anything. So um, if there is an issue just before or there is an issue just after then we have plenty of time to rearrange the schedule for the client or, um, or if, for example, a service is released, say a few hours before the client was to release, and then the client released, and then there was a problem. We don't know if it's the client which is causing the problem or if it's the service itself is causing the problem. So we instead of having to roll back two things at once you we try to avoid this because we know if if the service has been working for two days straight it's not going to be it's very unlikely it's going to be the service but once we publish the client it be, and there's an issue then we know that it's most likely an issue with the client itself and then we would have to hot fix it um so now i'll move on to the sort of the weird topic which i find quite somewhat hard to explain uh, is the database management and workflow sort of management area of my job. Um, in a sense, we use a, a tool which tracks tasks and bugs. Um, and it's my job to ensure that this is organized and people use it uh, in a way which benefits them. Uh, because each individual department is going to operate in its own way, which is the perfect way they want to operate. They're going to have their own internal flows. But when they come to the tool, they need just a single input and output for example, testing. They want to know exactly what, where they need to go when they need testing and where they need to go to get the results from the testing. So they just want uh, one, one specific area. Um, let me try and explain if I can explain that even better. So within this tracking tool, we basically have statuses for bugs and tasks, which are such as uh, open being that the task or the bug is 
has just been entered into the database in progress, meaning that it's, act, it's actively being worked on by someone, uh, either by fixed or being developed. And then closed uh, would mean that the, the bug has been fixed or the task has been completed, for example. Um, so I have to make sure, so we have a dev testing route in that where you have to put it into a dev testing status. And that indicates to all the dev testers on the team that this, this needs now needs dev testing. So it's not a flow which, it's sort of a, a flow or a rule set which all the teams in a sense need to follow. Um, so it's, so the communication flow is much easier and it's not everyone pinging or poking everyone on uh, different messaging services just to get uh, a dev test done. Um, plus everything's all tracked in the database, so it's much easier. So with that role, about 40% of it is communication, basically talking to uh, multiple teams and departments, to make sure I know exactly what they want. Um, because uh, when I'm developing some features for the tool, uh, it needs to work with everyone. So for example, let's say we have 12 teams and they all want to work slightly differently. I need to try and find a common ground between the 12 teams and decide who needs to make a compromise and who doesn't need to make a compromise. Um, I always try and make sure that everyone makes a compromise, but sometimes some teams I find uh, work in a way which better suits the tool than other teams. So it's a, it's, it's a, comp it's a balancing act, just like the releases as well. Uh, and then a lot of time after that, we'll be actually developing the feature as well for uh, the tool we use, um, such as, as I mentioned, we now have a dev testing uh, like flow within the tool itself. So there's only one place the uh, programmers need to go for this uh, to request a dev test. And I plan to expand on this. So we have other tools which are available to this, to this um, stuff. So we also have a, a tool which um, within it, which allows you to bring sort of an attention to a task or a bug. So if, if a programmer can't work on a bug, for example, they can put it into a different status and it indicates to everyone, Hey, this, this, this bug needs attention to it because the programmer can't work on it, basically. Um, and then the last part is mostly database management. It's making sure that the database is clean. Um, there's the organization of it, which for everyone to use is understandable and really simple to use because it, they can get really complicated when you have plus 40,000 uh, like items in the database and all the 12 teams, let's say, need to track like hundreds of uh, tasks and bugs per team. And it really starts to blow out proportions. And especially when you're trying to potentially merge multiple projects into one project, you're merging like 40,000 bugs and tasks into another 40,000 bugs and tasks. And somehow these all need to be organized and go to the right people uh, at the right time and give enough visibility uh, for them. And so allowing, so, with my job, allowing them to have the tools to make that simpler, it, it speeds up the efficiency of development basically and uh, streamlines everything. So some of the cool things which uh, we've added is obviously one of them, like I've already mentioned, is the dev testing route. So programmers and even managers, if they need it, they can quickly easily access uh, dev testing for even their specific department. Um, or their team specifically, uh, because some dev tests might be more suited towards uh, like engine people or some uh, might be more suited towards uh, uh, functionality dev testers or you know visual visual stuff like this and not more back-end stuff um, so that's something which I'm really proud of because that sort of came from also the Ferrana way as well so it was basically linked so we managed I managed to send that skill set from what we set up into Ferrana which to the Ubisoft Connect side um, so even though they're sort of completely different apart roles. They can, the tools there allowed, uh, allowed me to create something in, in uh, Ubisoft Connect. And finally, the release flow. So our release flow uh, was very, um, it, it was structured, but uh, we've managed to make it very uh, more streamlined and simpler now. Like the inputs and output points, which I like to call them basically the communication how many people you need to communicate with, it's been much minimized, it's more streamlined, it's easier to do. We still have the problems with, for example, we have to coordinate around 10 other teams, basically. Um, so 
possibly, hopefully, that uh, that improves in the future. Um, so that's basically that. Um, I think I think that's it. So yeah, thank you very much. Hopefully that didn't go too fast. <laughs> I feel like I spoke at a million miles an hour, uh, but hopefully that uh, covered everything for everyone. So thank you. <laughs> Thanks for that, Nick. Fantastic. We'll, um, as mentioned, we've got a couple of questions that have come through, but we'll be uh, more than happy to answer those right at the end of the uh, at the end of the three talks. So, who are we handing over to next? I think I can be the next one. Fantastic. Yeah, over to perfect. you, Manuel. Uh, let's go with sharing my screen. Just a thumbs up if you can see my presentation. Ah, perfect. So yeah, again, good morning, everyone. Um, so yeah, in my presentation, it's uh, we're gonna. I want to talk about my uh, journey. Uh, how did I get it to Ubisoft? What's the daily things that I have to do day to day as a programmer? Because uh, sometimes that thing is different from what we learn in like formal education and what it entails within the gaming industry uh and at the end just a couple of of quick tips for whoever is uh, interested into joining the video game industry from the programming point of view and especially for my specific role within the project so just uh, to talk a little bit uh, about my past and, and education so to say uh, i come from a very small tiny country in central america it's called costa rica uh, right now, I'm located in, in Germany. But um, so when I was in college, uh, I was I was already a gamer, like from a kid. I uh, will do, you know, flash games, uh, you know, call it call it all the popular games from from 2012, 2011. Um, but sadly, in my country, there is no program, so to say, like a college to go and learn about video game development. Uh, it's more about, you know, generic education. So, and I knew that I wanted to be like a programmer. I already had some, some like uh, going by myself uh, as a young person, but then uh, I chose to study uh, computer and informatics. I, it has a very uh, generic study plan. Uh, and I just wanted to highlight the things that helped me, uh, you know, to, to, to make it into the gaming industry. Uh, I learned about programming, operating system, uh, networking, databases, software engineering process. All of that was like uh, very interesting. But my, in that time, my interest was uh, very low level programming. So to say like operating system assembly, uh, things that need to, you know, like run really performant. So after shortly before my graduation, uh, I got an internship at a networking company. Uh, Hewlett Packard is a name that is pretty much worldwide known. Uh, my position there was uh, embedded systems programming. And basically, what does that mean? Uh, this uh, thing that you see on the left, it's, uh, it's a networking uh, device. It's just a huge router. And it's basically like an endpoint from where your routers in your house come from. Uh, usually in our houses, we have like 100 megabits per second uh, speed. And this device needed to handle 14 terabits per second. So as you can see, it was it needed to do a lot of things. So uh, I worked there for two years and all my experience was, uh, you know, a very performant uh, C and C++ code. So yeah, we built up an operating system basically from the ground and uh, I learned about about profiling and debugging, uh, made a lot of like good contacts, learned about a lot because, you know, it was like my first uh, touching grounds with uh, working you know, in real life. Um, with those contacts, uh, one of my leads uh, moved to Germany to work in Ubisoft. We kept uh, a really good, you know, like friendship. So we were like continually talking. There was a point in my career that I was like, okay, I want to switch uh, jobs uh, and he offered me, he told me that basically I work in this uh, cool video game for honor and we are hiring people from all, uh, you know, like all experiences so like junior, senior. So why don't you apply? And I did. Um, 
process took some months. Uh, and then I got my contract and was relocated to Germany. There I worked for uh, just a few months in For Honor. So that's what I met uh, Nick. Of Basically, it was like my ramp up in the company, how programming work, the processes, working with QC, all this dev testing that we saw in the past was something that I learned there. And then I got uh, reassigned to this amazing project and, and really cool video game, Rainbow Six Siege. Um, I was super happy because I was already, I already played the video game. So when I got offered, like, you know, we have like some place here, would you be interested? And I was like, of course, yeah, like I play it. So let's go. Um, I want to talk about a little bit about, uh, about the project. It's a, it's a first person shooter and it's completely multiplayer. It has very tactical gameplay design. It's a live game. It was released in 2015. So that's more than four, five years ago. Um, it actually have a really big player user base. Uh, we hit 70 million players on February. It's a big thing. It was a big thing for us. Uh, and the video game has a really big presence in esports. Uh, there are regional championships in the Europe, Asia, America. And there is uh, this event called uh, Rainbow Six Invitational, which happens each year. So it's like, so to say, the World Cup of Siege. Um, meaning for that is that we have a really continuous theme of like uh, balancing. So each year it comes new like operators, new weapons, new devices. And we also have a pretty big uh, artist team which provides new content. So every season there is new stuff to make the game interesting and, and it's, it has a really, really, really cool plan for the future. Uh, more and more to my role in the project, um, usually when you embark yourself into indie development uh, and you, you know, work with some couple of programmers, uh, you have to do everything. So pull up the engine, pull the assets. That's not the case when you join a AAA project because for example, Rainbow Six Siege had more than 100, 200 programmers at the time. So roles get distributed into uh, programmers that only deal with uh, the engine itself or graphics or audio. So there are different roles that you can, of course, like specialize yourself and apply to it. Uh, my case, since as you can see, my background was not from video games. I um, opt for joining as a UI programmer because it was easier for me to just take the really uh, code performance experiences and take it to video games. So yeah, that's my role, pretty much user interface. Of course, it doesn't mean that you are tied to this role. So as you grow in, the, in a project, in, for example, like a big company, you can uh, move if you have the opportunity to, for example, let's say like, I did UI, now I want to do graphics. What do I want? Uh, example, in Ubisoft, you have really uh, cool, interesting opportunities to do that, especially because we have many, many big projects. But, but for now, UI, UI is my thing. Um, what is exactly that? This text just comes from a Ubisoft you know, careers text. But uh, if I want to put it into like simple words, it's uh, basically you work with, um, very closely with artists and game design to make uh, things look nice. So basically, uh, artist provides you the assets, user experience puts the ideas, how should it look? And you are the one that implements it within your video game, taking the limitations of the engine, uh, what tools we had available, and so on. Uh, this is more of a formal definition. Again, it has a very, uh, big words like UI, HUD, but it, it basically, that's basically, basically it. Um, I really, often I get asked like, uh, yeah, you work in, in video games, so what uh, programming languages you use uh, day to day? And I have to say that I only use one, 100% of the day, and it's uh, C++. Uh, again, if you were asked, asked why, it's just because uh, that's the language that the engine uses in the case for like uh, Rainbow Six. And it's pretty common to find in AAA games that uh, we need languages that are very close to the machine so that, you know, we can manage to get the big game to run in 60 FPS, 4K, 
uh, all of that is pretty pretty important. But um, secondarily, I have I have to use tools that are coded in languages like C Sharp and Python, and those are also languages that you can find usually in, in more commercial engines. So, for example, think about now Unity or Unreal. All of those use like a mix of those languages. So, if you ask me, what kind of of, of uh, languages you should learn as to build a career as a video game programmer for this will be like pretty much my recommendation because it's what I what I use day to day and uh, more about what do I need to go from uh, art and assets and documents to what the game looks like uh, my tools the the one that I use the most is basically uh, we have so to say frameworks to build screens and menus in the game and connect them to the engine, which it will be our, our biggest tool because it's what, what builds the game. So yeah, pretty much like uh, as definition of what the engine is, is basically the, uh, the big program that holds all the assets and code. And that's, that's where I operate. So, uh, I take the, for example, I take a menu and I integrate it into the engine. And of course, for that, I'm going to need a, a compiler and a code editor. So for example, think, I don't know, like Visual Studio and a compiler. And uh, after that process, I take the change. And the next step will be, for example, uh, make a build, make a test request and have tester to uh, check it out and then uh, if it all goes well, then we integrate into the game. And if not, then I have to go back to the framework, do the changes, talk to more people if it's needed. Uh, and then again, until I get the until I get the thumbs up from testers and I can integrate it into the actual build. Uh, more tools that you know are like secondarily, and it's pretty common into any software engineering process. We keep a uh, the changes, you know, as a, as a, uh, Nick mentioned, like change lists and this like um, version control systems just allow us to have this uh, control over what gets into the game. Uh, and then again, code review tools. So big projects have like many programmers and, you know, we are like all humans. So we check each other's code. So that's why that's, uh, that's really good because we can like, uh, spot bugs before going to testing, um, seeing the code quality. Uh, so maybe we overlook something and your colleague uh, checks you out and then, you know, go back to changing before going to testing. And then again, continuous integration and deployment is uh, what Nick told you about all this process of, of uh, dev testing, automation, all of that, make sure that your code is actually doing what is intended to. And then we don't have to do, you know, like this live box and that, you know, is just uh, not good for, for the video game and for the project and for the company itself. Uh, next, something uh, also worth noticing, uh, even though I'm a programmer, I do not interact with other programmers as much as with other teams. Uh, I can tell you that when you start to build a new feature, you're main point of communication is user experience or you can call them yeah ux designers uh, they are the ones who first will give you a document and we have to uh, discuss if it's doable if we can do this or not so uh, first thing that i do is talk to them go through the documents read them all uh, then we involve artists which are also check the documents to check all these mock-ups and produce you know all the visuals, graphics, well, all, all the content. And finally, then will be me and other programmers who put them all together, make them look nice, uh, go for testing, and then finally deploy. Because as again, the live game just goes on and on. Uh, there are, again, two figures that are also worth uh, noticing. So it will be producer. Then again, like as, as Nick uh, mention it on on the uh, Ubisoft Connect. We also have uh, producers and managers who will check on our task, uh, 
see that we are doing the proper things. If there's something comes up, they're like our main communication point with a big project. So we can like centralize our work into actually producing, you know, code and features. And the testing department, which is core and really vital to us to keep uh, continuous communication. And even though we don't talk about the, with them about technical things, communication again works on more about the results and things that has to be done. So yeah, as a programmer, uh, even though it's really important that you do your job, uh, it's really important that you know, you know how to communicate and uh, with that, your job becomes really, really more easy. Uh, something that is really cool noticing about uh, or to, to say about my project is that um, we are, especially my team, we are programmers and we have to do our job because we have to, we get paid to do it. But we are actually uh, enthusiastic into the game. We can say that we are also like devs and gamers. Uh, that is really cool in, in video games to have this uh, being a player because you are inside the project and you are inside the artist. So, for example, uh, you see something that is, looks, I don't, I don't think this is how uh, players would like to see it. And maybe the artist has not that insight of a player. And, and yeah, so we can revise things and give our inputs even before as uh, it hits like uh, the players. And as I can tell, as you can see in this screenshot, Siege uh, is uh, really cool. They made us skins that says developer. So you can, you know, like uh, show other players that you are actually uh, involved in the project. And uh, we hold, uh, maybe not now in Corona, but uh, we usually host uh, play sessions to check the new things, uh, have a team building because we also enjoy like, you know, it, it's kind of cool uh, going to a game and kill your boss and you will be cool about it. So yeah, it, it's, uh, it's, pretty, it's pretty good and healthy, the interaction that we have like between each other. Uh, so now I, I talk about the, all this, how do we made it from design to the coding? How does it look like? So yeah, I would like to show you uh, projects that uh, I was actually involved in, in development in a primary or like secondary way. Um, and you might recognize them if you play if you play Siege because they are like really really recent, so last year or so. Uh, Siege is how the industry decided to call it like a game as a service. So usually games as a service are uh, games that are alive and it has a team that uh, continuously deploy new content. And of course, everything comes through through our eyes. So if if it looks pretty, it's going to be more. Uh, interesting for the user and it's more likely for him to buy it so the prettier it looks the better uh, one of the things we have are these things called alpha packs so you play the game if you win you might have a chance for example here I have like 50 percent chance of obtain this pack for free uh, you open up and you have like a cool skin or like a charm or something that you can put it into your operators we did this screen uh a lot of years ago, like four, four or five years ago, and we give like maintenance to it. And every time we have like a cool event like Christmas or uh, Halloween, we have alpha packs. We all produce that in our studio. So that's pretty cool because it involves, uh, again, three teams all the time. Uh, this was actually my first project in Siege. Uh, first thing that we did that actually hit the players. It was an entire rework of the shop did not look like this. It was just like a black screen with text. Uh, it looked awful. And then our designers came up with these uh, new, new looks. Uh, we evaluated, we had the assets. So this was like my first uh, big project. Uh, now it, it, has, it has given good results in, in shops and sales. Then uh, another big uh, thing that it's uh, recent from these years is a battle pass. So yeah, a battle pass is uh, maybe the next slide can show it better. It basically gives the player the opportunity to gain free content by just playing. So in these tiers, you go tier by tier with XP. Every time that you play a game, you get XP. If you win, you get more. And eventually uh, you have a certain amount of time to complete it. As you can see, I, I did mine. This was the first um, 
battle pass with purchasable content. So it was really, really good for the game. Uh, our department was really happy about it. And uh, very recently we had the third or fourth battle pass. And for the next season, you can expect the next one is going to be even cooler. Uh, and yeah, uh, right now, all these are like uh, projects that we already deployed and uh, we are still, uh, I'm still involved in things that are like soon to be uh, research experimentations. So it's, it, it's more to come in, in Siege. Um, now, just for the final part, sometimes uh, I like to mention three small things that usually you don't get told, like, I don't know, in college or like in tutorials that uh, might help you if you are like uh, chasing uh, a career in game dev. Uh, this one is very generic and very important. Just uh, have confidence. Like uh, in the programming, there is this big thing like people call it imposter syndrome that you don't feel like prepared or like uh, this guy told me that Siege had like 400, uh, 200 programmers. So am I going to fit there? Am I going to be, uh, am I going to do a good job? So sometimes you have to like work with those barriers, like throw yourself into the water. Like as I told you, when I, um, when I interviewed for the, for Ubisoft, I was like, yeah, like uh, even though I don't have the, the, I didn't have like, game dev uh, formal education i'm like a gamer i know the game like i love the company and i will prove you that my programming skills are fit for the job and you know here i am um so yeah basically be confident about it throw yourself uh, like you already have the no so you have to chase the yes uh that's pretty that's pretty good mindset uh very important to do your research uh again i learned to make video games so to say as by going to the internet, seeing tutorials. Uh, it's really cool that you already are in an institution that have all this, uh, that give you already the tools. So really take advantage of things like this, like uh, this event, uh, talks online. And, uh, yeah, it, it's basically pure research. Like you are the person that like, you're going to learn only by yourself, like by your own uh, mindset. And keep that working. That's super important. So uh go to game jams, uh, attend to events, talk to people, uh, things like us, like ask questions that, that we will be more happy to do it. Uh, the more people that you know, the more chances you're going to be uh, presented. Uh, so yeah, I think that's, uh, that's pretty much my, my presentation. Dad, thank you for your time. And yeah, I think the next one is so. All right, I'm going to remember to unmute this time. <laughs> okay, so my presentation is going to be slightly uh, different, um, mostly because I haven't really got as much, say, hard skill compared to uh, Manuel and Nick. So I'm just going to talk a little bit about how to get into the games industry um, when you're not necessarily an artist or a programmer. And it's perfectly possible, so please let me know. When my screen is shared. All good? Yep. Awesome. Okay, so yeah, like I said, I'm just going to talk a little bit about my journey um, into the games industry, not really having any kind of programming or RT background whatsoever. Uh, so Yes, a little bit about me. Uh, my parents are from Myanmar, uh, otherwise known as Burma. You might have been reading about it on the news recently. Uh, I actually was born in Wrexham, so technically I am Welsh. So please don't hold that against me. There is absolutely nothing wrong with being Welsh. Uh, and I grew up in Liverpool, which is a port city very famous for a couple of things. <laughs> Uh, and I went to university in Manchester, which is where I stayed um, and just continued working um, and mostly playing games for that part uh, before joining uh, Blizzard in Versailles, France, uh, moved over in 2009. Um, and yeah, and I've been there for about 10 years, uh, left at the beginning of 2019, um, moved to Germany for family reasons um, and then 
eventually applied everywhere because you know after working for so long a month of unemployment does not suit well with me so um applied to uh various industries outside of gaming as well just to see uh but uh ubisoft got back to me and uh moved to uh well i was already in cologne but i had to make the uh, commute to dusseldorf uh where, where the uh ubisoft office is based or at least the blue bite one so a little bit of background on uh, my time in Manchester. Um, I actually studied pharmacology. Uh, so again, very, very different from, um, you know, <laughs> anything to do with gaming or programming um, or like even IT. Um, and I specialize with in medicinal and biological chemistry. Um, in the during that time, um, I was working in the Manchester University Students' Union Bar, um, otherwise known as the Manchester Academy. So heavy interest in music. I, like I said, um, it's not necessarily a programming background, but um, one of the things that really uh, got to me was music in games. Uh, and there was this one gig where uh, like this group of four guys on cellos just played pretty much all of Final Fantasy <laughs> uh, on cellos in, in the smallest uh, room in uh, Manchester. So that was kind of, that was kind of cool to see. Um, then after uni, um, I pretty much took any kind of jobs. I think I joined, I think most of you are probably familiar with joining a recruitment agency and they kind of check out your profile and they put you wherever you can fit. Uh, that's where I ended up at Lloyd's TSB, uh, just doing data entry. So, you know, it's the job that kind of paid the bills, but you know, I was working with a computer pretty much every day. I was uh, had that computer experience from just mostly gaming um, in my pastime. And yes, like I basically funded my way through World of Warcraft <laughs> for about five, six years. Um, the funny thing is, like, even though I didn't have a education in uh, like IT programming or art. Um, and obviously there's no presentation that's not worth doing without a cat picture. So yes, that is my cat while I was reading. Uh, it was actually during this period of time that I found a lot of the skills I was gaining uh, helped me get into the industry, funnily enough. Um, I organized a lot of community events around <laughs> World of Warcraft. Uh, um, we ha I held LAN parties. I went to LAN parties. Some of you may be familiar with the Insomnia events in Newbury. Uh, I don't have a photo of that. It's not safe for this presentation. Uh, but this is one of the community events that uh, is, used to be held every year in Manchester. Uh, again, it's mostly a World of Warcraft community related. Um, and part of organizing that is learning a lot about logistics. Um, you need to have a very kind of very specific mindset and uh, to really keep everything in mind, um, like flights, bus times, um routes uh you know prices it, you, you'd have to really be uh aware of this kind of market and and just sort of coordinate about 200 people across 50 different countries to all arrive roughly at the same time to try and organize hotels for them uh yeah so it's a kind of and that was just done voluntarily it was not paid at all um but yeah, meeting all these uh, different people at these events, uh, you get a big, you know, cultural understanding, um, not just, you know, hey, this is like, you know, uh, the Swedish guy and um, this is this Finnish guy and this is German guy, but it's about you're connected through your love of gaming and like how that culture impacts their play style and it kind of broadens your perspective and worldview on things uh, just in general, but also, you know, when it comes to things like translation, um, how some things can just does not translate well from one language to another. And so, you know, um, there's a lot of understanding that comes with it. Uh, and I learned a lot about leadership. Uh, when you're trying to organize a raid of like 39 other people in World of Warcraft, you, <laughs> you need to have kind of a, a presence about yourself uh, and, you know, a certain respect that needs to be garnered. Uh, this is one of the guild meets from 2007. Um, one of many, uh, again, organizing it all, um, trying to get everybody together. 
and um, yeah, it kind of leads onto relationship building. And this is like so one of these like three things you don't realize are so useful uh, in such a, an industry. Uh, relationship building, networking, as Manuel mentioned before, um, just getting to know people, uh, finding out why their careers are. Like some people are going to be artists doing this. Some people are going to be programmers doing that and all in different companies and they can uh, share knowledge with you. Um, and for the most part, um, in terms of at least the programming side, I'm self-taught. Um, I think it wasn't until 2000 and seven uh that i built my own my first pc by myself and uh didn't have like youtube tutorials or linus to tell me how to do it uh, i went to the library and got a book <laughs> and uh because i was uh, i saved so much money to try and build my pc for the first time i didn't want to pay someone else to do it um i just i needed to do it by myself so i i read about it um got advice from again a lot of my guild mates who who have who have experienced in that and yeah uh and um self-taught a lot of things especially when it comes to understanding like data uh html php at the time which i think nobody really uses anymore right <laughs> so uh yeah, I had to learn all of that. And with Lloyd's TSB, um, they were using certain tools which required a little bit of um, background knowledge, um, like actual coding knowledge, um, because it wasn't just simply like entering key data. Like I had to manipulate the data sometimes to get the program to work. So yeah, I had to teach myself um, that, you know, how, how to program essentially in order to do my job. So yes, a lot of the skills that I've, uh, sort of developed and gained uh, to help me get into the industry in the first place just came from mostly all of the volunteer work uh, that I have done like in the in the five, seven years um, since being in Manchester. So that led me to be scouted out by Blizzard. Um, I had one or two friends who had already was already working there. Um, believe me, I have already applied, I think, two or three times at this point uh, and was rejected. Uh, so, you know, you never, but the key thing is to be persistent, uh, find out, you know, where can you improve? So um, after, you know, talking about my community uh, events, organizing it all, after talking about, uh, learning how to program, being self-taught, and uh, having an understanding when working in a bank that you're handling a lot of private data. Um, so, you know, disc uh, discrepancy, discretionary uh, uh, is a thing. Then uh, I got an interview. So I got accepted and joined uh, officially in 2009 as a game master. Back then um, it was called a game master. Nowadays it's called a customer support representative or, you know, CS. Um, and after my initial training, I was asked to join a pilot program called the Total Support Team. Um, this was a new experience because back in uh, customer support centers in those days, you usually separate the departments from people who just know the game. So I knew the game a lot. I knew uh, all the encounters. I knew how to uh, uh, how things should be working. Um, but then they separated, uh, say, like the billing department and the tech department. So you know your tech support would be different from you know payment support from your game support. And this pilot program was to train everybody in all three things. Uh, so, you know, you only ever have to talk to one person rather than being passed around. So, yes, covered in-game support, billing support, and technical support. Uh, this um, pilot program actually ended up being um, what, if any of you have actually played a Blizzard game um, or World of Warcraft uh, and contacted support, that is what the current C uh, customer support role is now, or at least as since 2011. You are going to be talking to one person who is trained uh, in all these three features. Um, and my contribution to that was uh, I had to make the report. <laughs> so um, I learned a lot about uh, report building uh, during that particular program. Um, in terms of 
other stuff outside of customer support, other, you know, doing my job, um, I volunteered again. Um, Gamescom is an event that happens in uh, Cologne. Um, unfortunately, not in the not last year and probably not this year. Um, it's probably one of the world, Europe's world's uh, Europe's biggest event for gaming. Um, uh, maybe a couple of you have actually been there or have, have read about it. Um, and I, my role there was to actually be a cosplay handler. Um, I've also volunteered as to be a guest handler, which is a thing. So I would basically be looking after esports players, um, or I'd be looking after you know a couple of the developers that they would fly in. My job was to make sure that um, they had their schedules, they had their scripts, uh, that they were you know that they were at the venue on time, that they got into you know they got made it back to the hotel. So like there's a whole <laughs> position just to make sure that these uh, these guys are taken care of. Um, <clears throat> so. That's a part of my job, just to look after cosplayers and uh, guests. Um, and for a while after that, um, or at least alongside that, um, I was an acting senior game master. So once you've been working for in a certain position for a while, um, you start become essentially a team lead. Uh, with that particular position, you take up leadership training, which again, I was kind of already familiar with um, <laughs> from my WOW experience. Um, you learn quite a lot about actual project management um, and I'm talking about you know methodologies. Uh, so you get trained and certified in that. Um, and with that, um, <clears throat> I saw an opportunity to join Consumer Products, which is essentially like the Blizzard gear store um, and joined that team in 2016. <clears throat> Sorry. Uh, yeah. And uh, the consumer products team, you're probably, maybe if you've been to Gamescom or BlizzCon, you've seen the actual physical uh, store um, where we display all the Blizzard uh, merchandise. And uh, my role in that was not only, at least on the web uh, website, was to control stock and manage inventory. Um, I had to manage logistics as well. So whenever you notice that something's low in stock because it's selling like crazy, then you need to put a reorder in. Um, you know, it's not, doesn't sound very technically interesting, but that's one of the things you had to, to do uh, with the tool that was developed in house. So it wasn't an external tool that you had to learn. You had to, um, which is why I can't really show you anything. Uh, it was an internal tool that was developed within the company uh, to manage this stuff. But what you did get to do was you get to talk to um, booth designers. Like there's companies whose jobs are only doing this and they do it for, for the games industry too. Uh, there's an event in London, um, which is the brand managing event. And uh, they basically bring uh, like, you know, not just the gaming companies, but also uh, comic comp uh, comics. Um, Hasbro is probably the biggest one. Uh, and you get to meet all these people within this particular side of the industry, which is like as a side to gaming. Um, but yeah, like designing a booth using art assets of, you know, the games that you love, uh, making sure everything looks amazing. Um, <clears throat> so out of that, uh, yeah, I learned uh, a lot about, you know, project management, um, coordination, um, team building for sure, because you do, you have to be <clears throat> the one that organizes, um, you know, all these events for your team. And uh, um, yeah, like all the, all the little nitty gritty stuff that comes with it, like, uh, like ma um, payment orders and all that stuff. Um, then I've learned a lot about marketing and e-commerce. Uh, probably had to jam pack myself uh, with information in the first six months of, of joining the new team. Cause it is not, I don't have a marketing background. I definitely don't have like a business background. Um, so again, self-taught is bought all these books. Um, at this point there was uh, online courses. So just uh, learned as much as I could about this uh, particular side of the business. Um, <clears throat> there's a lot of data analysis that you have to, that you know, a lot of people don't expect this. I didn't expect this joining the gaming industry. You have to analyze a lot of Excel sheets. <laughs> so if you're experienced with Excel, <laughs> uh, it's, uh, it's a good, um, you're already a step ahead because a it's 
the most basic tool everybody will use. And if you're an ex expert in it, um, you're already a step ahead because I had to learn so much uh, <laughs> extra stuff just for Excel, just to analyze data. Um, uh, yeah, uh, which, you know, was helpful for other projects. Um, event management is sort of another thing in itself. Um, and uh, I, I dabbled a little bit in esports event production because those two are actually interlinked. But when you're trying to plan a booth, you're doing a schedule for, for uh, esports players, uh, you need to uh, coordinate um, the film crew because you know it's being televised you need to coordinate with the lighting sound you have to coordinate with so many different teams and half of them aren't part of the gaming industry so just having good knowledge of like your own industry as well as others particularly in this field where it's like you know a televised performance um is, is super handy and i recommend reading up if you're interested in that kind of thing i recommend reading up uh, a lot about it um, takeaways from my time at Blizzard, uh, a lot of self-management. Um, you need to be organized, you need to be on top of everything. Um, and that's not something that comes very easy for someone who likes to get up at 10 a.m. So uh, <laughs> there's a lot of uh, books and um, training courses that you can take um, to help um, better yourself in these areas. Um, I'm not a naturally organized person. I just, I just learned how to be. Uh, I'm not a naturally, you know, uh, natural person who can just take care of themselves. I had to learn. I had to learn all of this in order to do what I enjoyed and do what I love, which is working in the uh, games industry. And um, the one thing that you will hear in any kind of industry, uh, be it gaming, but uh, or TV, uh, is you need to be able to drive your own career. Um, take courses, um, go that extra mile, read books, um, <laughs> learn languages, you know, um, programming languages or, you know, uh, uh, spoken languages, because the more um, equipped you are, the better you're able to handle whatever comes your way. And in an industry like the gaming industry, where there is lots of changes um, <clears throat> on the fly, uh, lots of um, sort of flexibility is needed that it's not necessarily a good idea to just stick with one thing um and uh if you do that you get to you know take part uh in various events uh and join a huge team of people and uh yeah this is after 10 years you get a sword and shield so this was my goodbye uh before <laughs> i left for germany um and uh moved to Ubisoft, where I was hired to be a business operations manager for the you now Ubisoft Connect, formerly Uplay. Uh, as I have not been in the company for that long, um, I will say that the team has been amazing. Uh, uh, everyone is super friendly, and definitely the atmosphere is very just chill. You know, there's no there's no stress over anything, uh, and everyone I've met has been absolutely just wonderful. It, it was such a great fit um, just coming from staying within the industry, um, me, knowing that the people that I would go into the office are also, you know, fellow gamers. Um, and you can just nerd out with your colleagues uh, and um, every now and then like play among us and just you know, realize that your boss is sus. Uh, yeah. <laughs> um, what I do there, though, it's kind of a mix of things. And unfortunately, because of what I handle is a lot more confidential than I think what uh, Manuel and, and Nick uh, can talk about. Um, so there's a lot of background stuff. Uh, there's a lot of topics regarding business strategy. So yes, where you've got teams who focus on the UI uh, design of a program of the client you've got nick's role who has to sort of compile it all together for release uh there's the business side of it which is okay does this changes make sense uh what features need to be improved can we implement it uh can we get this in by the end of this year um so yeah you have to plan with like a year and a bit ahead of what you want your program your game uh, to look like. Uh, this relies a lot on market data analysis, which is a fun term to throw around. Um, again, 
had no idea about it because uh, a business operations manager is like very much more business and less and less uh, like more doing because I was more of the doing position. Um, so this is definitely strategy, thinking, planning, uh, lots of presentations, lots of um, timelines to work with. Um, so the only sort of doing aspect of my job uh, so far, I kind of vaguely put operational tasks, but I had to learn a lot about background tools, uh, which is why I mentioned there's a level up in my technical knowledge. I had no idea about C++ and now I know a little bit. Um, I had very little use with um, uh, certain program tool, uh, project management tools, so like Jira is one of them. Um, never had to use SharePoint as much as I as I used to. Uh, still a lot of Excel, that, that won't go away. Uh, so yeah, um, but I never knew that I've by the end of like three months, I would knew what a backend API would be. Now I know. So <laughs> there's a definite, definite like level up in technical knowledge, uh, which is the key thing when joining the industry that you'll you'll never stop learning, um, and you shouldn't stop learning. Um, what else to do? Uh, like Nick, uh, I work with a lot of internal and external teams. Um, and now internal could also mean like within Ubisoft. Uh, an internal can also mean within my team. So uh, I do both. I work within my team. I work within Ubisoft, but not uh, outside my team. And I also work with um, external partners um, who aren't uh, Ubisoft. So there's a lot of, there's a lot more teams, a uh, lot more projects that I have to coordinate with um, and, you know, get back to, to you know, Nick saying, okay, can we get these features into the client because, you know, so-and-so needs this um, and sort of coordinating all these timelines and being that, that, that middle guy, right. That has to be the point of contact for everybody for this particular project um, or for the client, because everybody wants changes on the client, uh, but it's not just the client. It's also the back end. There is stuff that happens uh, in the background that I also have to, to manage um, uh, it's a little bit more tech, well, I say technical, but, uh, when you buy a product, uh, you know, it's not, you know, there's, it's, it's digital information, but how does that digital information get, uh, into your Ubisoft account? How does it stay there? You know, um, so I work on the back end of that as well. Um, and yeah, it's a lot of project management, a lot of coordination and a lot of execution. And I think a lot of what I am doing now can only was only possible because of what I have gained and volunteered to do in the past 10 years. So, yeah, sorry if uh, it was a bit long. <laughs> um, I will say that uh, there's been amazing training opportunities um, at Ubisoft. I get to play with Lego. That's a thing. Uh, <laughs> it's a type of um, uh, project management uh, sort of style of uh, team building in a way, sort of solving problems through creative use of Lego. So that's kind of, that was kind of an interesting uh, thing to learn about. And the cool thing is uh, I get to travel a bit more. Um, we have a studio in Malmö uh, in Sweden. Uh, there's also uh, studios in Paris, We've got one in Montreal uh, and a couple in Asia and San Francisco. So um, the, uh, our team, at least for Ubisoft Connect are spread everywhere. And so to travel to uh, these different studios, to these different countries and just meet your teammates, essentially, uh, that's uh, been an amazing opportunity um, with joining Ubisoft. So with that, thank you. I'm sorry for this very long run. I <laughs> uh, hope you enjoyed it. Awesome. Thanks so much, guys. That was amazing. Zoe, that was awesome. Emmanuel, Nick, thank you so much. Guys, we're going to come into the, uh, the question portion of today's uh, event. It's going to start off with some Q&A that the guys have uh, prepared that they'll answer, followed by the questions that you guys have been asking um, in the Q&A portion. So uh, over to you guys once again uh, for the questions. Who's leading on that? Uh, where, where, do, where do we see the questions? Uh. <laughs> 
Yeah, I, ha I have them here. <laughs> excellent, but, uh, excellent. Well, I'll tell you what, guys, because um, Nick, I was under the impression you was going to answer some stuff collectively, but I'll have. Oh to... yes, the group, the group thing. Yes. Yeah, the group. Yeah, thing yeah, we first. can we can do that first. Yes, definitely. Yeah. Uh, uh, let's have a look. Uh, so we share. I'll share my screen so we have something kind of on screen. Uh, there's the button. There it is. Share screen. Right. Here we go. So there's a few like key points that we wanted to talk about as sort of a group for everyone here. And one of the the first key point is basically communication. It's primarily going to be half of your work is communication. It's absolutely humongous. Uh, you're going to be talking to uh, like potentially 20 people a day plus, or even like even more potentially depending who's. And you're going to go in big meetings with 100 plus people in. Um, and if you need to do a presentation for 100 plus people, you need to be able to communicate ideas and uh, and what you want to communicate effectively and easily. Um, so I don't know, I'll leave, it's sort of a group thing. So if anyone else wants to jump in, so uh, Emma or Zoe. Um, yeah, okay. Um, yeah, I can definitely agree on the communication part. Um, there is a lot of, again, when it comes to training, um, there are a lot of books on communication methods, styles, uh, understanding your own, uh, as well as uh, recognizing the communication style of others and therefore allowing you to adapt because uh, I've, I've had to do that quite a lot, um, especially when you're trying to do a, a presentation uh, to a very, very specific audience. Um, and if they all happen to be, you know, higher level managers then you don't really want to to, to lay your cap pictures all over your presentation you know that kind of thing um you know also but it's not just about the, like the hierarchy of things but it's understanding people um uh, the culture plays a lot a uh, big part in communication as well um just having an understanding that like certain offices which are mostly oh i don't know german <laughs> might have a might favor a particular communication style um and sort of understanding that maybe what they wrote maybe not what they meant and so you know um yeah uh but it's also maybe adapting your own um to maybe not use as many complicated words or just making uh like short sentences because uh, nobody really has time to read like this much text in an email. Uh, so yeah, like, definitely communication methods, styles. Um, yeah, it, it's it's being trained in that as you're going to be using it 90% of your time in, at work. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Now that Saul mentioned that something is uh, super important when you uh, in a more in a more technical process and is how to explain complicated stuff into simple things because uh, as you go into the like for example me as a programmer i i know uh, the very specific needy greedies of of what should i do for example to have this screen going or to make you know like the bullets do the right amount of damage and uh i need to first explain for example to the, the tester i need you to open the game and just do this and this and that uh and uh, or for example to your producer if you have to explain to him like okay this is uh, not possible because i cannot do it this way let's do it that way uh, sometimes in order to have people to understand you have to change your the way that you say things so in in, in if you are going for the technical part uh, we have this really mindset of like training your soft skills so as as both so and nick mentioned like uh, assertive communication, knowing how to say things, uh, how to simplify stuff is, is, is super important. And also, like for example, uh, one 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 way to learn all of this is yes, go to the theory. Uh, there are books and there are trainings about it. But if you want some sort of like field experience that it doesn't have to be, for example, already in your job, is uh, uh, I really like that in the gaming community there is a lot of of uh, initiatives to make like game jams. Uh, and that's really, it, it, it's a really cool exercise because you can either go uh, with your friends or with random people and it's you and five people and you have, I don't know, two, like I, I did one in the Ubisoft made one recently and yeah, you have to, uh, 
uh, manage you and four people to deliver something doable in like 24 hours and you're going to discover that sometimes it's like you know like rainbows and and candy and sometimes can be hell uh, and you learn always from that like learn good things learn bad things uh conflict resolution all the things that we said like in communication are are, are things that you can like improve doing some sort of activities I'll move to the next one. Uh, opportunity. Um, so this is, uh, so for example, where uh, Emmanuel here is in a very core development role, such as a, a programmer. And I think a lot of people, uh, when they want to get in the industry, is they just see these core development roles. Now, I'm not, I'm not bashing on uh, Emma's role. Obviously, we need programmers. If not, there's no business, basically. Um, but there's also, there's, uh, thousands of other departments around it. There's even, you know, there's testing, which is well, this core role, but there's also um, what I do, project assistant, that's not necessarily a core role, but we also have IT teams and stuff like this. And um, these are all, uh, they're not core for the development of a video game, but they're core for keeping the company alive, basically, because if one of the departments, you lose all the IT department, it's like, when there's a massive IT problem and all the infrastructure goes down, the whole company goes down together. So we all have to work in tandem. It's just uh, them, them core roles obviously have a brighter light because that's where the, uh, as a, where, where my old producer would say where the sexy project is basically. So, um, so yeah. Yep. I can, um, definitely vouch for that there are other positions in the gaming industry other than programmers um, <laughs> uh, yeah there's I mean people a lot of uh, forget about it but there's I mean there's also there's, there is a marketing department because you know you need a department to promote the game um, then you've got the PR department uh, um, again like working with uh, like more the business side of things uh, to to make partnership deals uh, in order to again promote your game, um, and yeah, I mean as well as just the IT uh, guys, um, there's also the you know the the people who build the tools and the processes to help the company run, and yeah, it may not sound as flashy as hey yes I'm a game designer on this game, but uh, you definitely hey I work for. Ubisoft or, you know, I work for this amazing game company, uh, this is my job, and I'm in this position to help make it run. So there's always these other elements, um, and you can intern for pretty much any of these uh, departments. Although, uh, I'm going to have to double check that, but I'm pretty sure there is an intern position for a lot of um, these departments, there's an intern, you know, IT technician, there's an intern QC tester, there's an intern PR marketing uh, position, there's um, usually an intern uh, as a programmer, depending on, you know, what type of programming and depending on what game. Um, but even as something as like, there's an intern uh, position for like an account manager, uh, which is already kind of a bit of a vague, <laughs> um, a vague sort of position, but account managers are essentially project uh, coordinators, project managers um, that have to work with a lot uh, between a lot of different teams and a lot of different people. So, um, you know, just you know, don't limit your your searches to just you know programmer or artist. Um, like, look at the entire what what does the company want? Uh, what are they looking for? And you might find these odd you know, positions and uh, like any opportunity. Uh, I had an old colleague who joined uh, as an artist eventually now, but before she was the receptionist at uh, Blizzard. She she joined as a receptionist and just studied and worked and then got an internship. And uh, now she's uh, one of the um, character designers. So like any, don't, don't think just because you're not getting like that artist job straight away, doesn't mean you won't get there. Don't be afraid to start, you know, somewhere a little bit uh, lower just to get in and then work your way up. That's also an opportunity one can take. Yeah, exactly. And uh, yeah, as, as in my point of view, something that you uh, you can say that is like a blessing at, at being in a, in a big company is that 
yeah, you are on, on, you can focus your, if you're in core development, you can focus there, but you are only able to deliver successful uh, products uh, because you have all these departments that makes the product to look nice and to manage your time, uh, focus the development to some, like, you know, help the team to, it's it just, I, I say like a big, you know, everybody's dancing at the same time. And if someone messes up, then whole thing goes down. Uh, it's it, it's good to have a like like in a big like if you if you're looking at it from the point of view of the big company that's uh, good that you have this uh such of like map like uh, this power to have like many people in different roles and with something very specific uh, if you go for example if you are in the more i want to be uh i want to make my indie company or just i want to do my game sometimes you have to keep in mind that there's all these roles that makes it successful uh you know ubisoft games because we have good marketing the games are good the quality uh all of that is made and sometimes the public yes only see it you know that the only thing that carries the you know artists and, and, and designers and, and whatever but you have to like you know look at a little bit uh brighter and see that there are many things that you can be involved and it will be as big as big as any other people Cool. Uh, and last one. Now, I actually added the, the, the sins like sneaky at the very end uh, because I thought it was actually very good uh, from listening to the other two people here uh, from PowerPoint. There we go. Learn. It's learning, like never stop. Always learn something new. It's, if, it's very easy uh, when you're in a, like, when you're doing something constantly, which is the exact same, to basically forget about the learning aspect and just focus down and work. That obviously you need to do, but once you realize it, you're like, actually, I might need to go and learn something else because the industry is fast paced. It's constantly moving and growing and there's always something new which is coming around the next corner. Um, and if you know that skill set, which someone else doesn't know, well, then you're a key candidate or a key person on that team who might be able to take responsibility of that project within it. Um, uh, you never know. Um, and apart from, and with learning as well, also don't be afraid to make mistakes. In order to learn, you need to make a mistake. Um, you're like, you can read a book and learn something from that, but if you haven't practiced it, then you don't really know how to actually do it. You have the knowledge that you think you know how to do it, but you actually need to prove to yourself that you actually know how to do it. And you're most likely going to fail along the way. But every failure is a victory done later on, basically. So um, it's really important. Yep. Pretty, yeah. I, I mean, Nick pretty much said it all. <laughs> um, I mean, I, I'm a bit, a little more old school. So yeah, I mean, I do the, the book learning thing. But um, you know, he is right. You do need practice, and I, my practice uh, was just being a team lead, uh, leading. I don't know, thirty. Well, I became twenty-five uh, after a patch. Uh, <laughs> um, twenty-five people in a raid. Um, you sort of um, leading people around Manchester during a tour because you know you got like thirty odd people just wanting to have a look around um, Ashton. <laughs> um, and then, you know, I, 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 that was my doing. So I learned about, I read about it, and my my doing was just uh, uh, that that opportunity. It's kind of like with learning languages or learning programming, because programming is a language. Like just reading doesn't do it. You need to actually um, put it into practice. Um, you know, you can read as many books about, uh, you know, self help, self management as much as you want, but you also have to put it into practice and yes there will be many mistakes made along the way uh, you'll only get better um, and yeah I mean I think just as a side project I'm, I'm, I'm messing around in the Unreal Engine and just learning how to basically build uh, um, you know buildings uh, also thanks to Valheim a little bit but uh, <laughs> just discovering a talent for, for level design and um, interior design architecture within games uh, there are the tools uh, there are free tools available for it so you know you can learn by doing just download them and just have at it um, using like SketchUp 
uh, I'm again, I'm not an artist. Uh, I had to learn how to use it for moving into an apartment, but it just went into something else. Uh, now I'm sort of designing buildings for a game that is just stored on my computer. So it's, um, there's always opportunities to learn. So don't stop. <laughs> yep, yep. I think, uh, yeah, you pretty much said the, the good stuff. And just just a quick add. Uh, yeah, it, it's super important to learn, but uh, especially in the in this industry, everything that you learn, even though you think is like the most simple stuff, save it up, document it, start building your portfolio. Just never think that this is just worthless. Uh, keep it there because you, you either improve on it and you have this documentation of like, yeah, I started and I did this, this simple, you know, platform game. Uh, but at least I learned something about character and, and, and designing. And maybe you then join a game jam and you have all this previous thing that you learn. And, and then again, because it's very important when you apply, for example, to like a gaming job, having some, uh, the formal experiences is good, but especially if you are like becoming like starting as a student with, you know, maybe some internships on game jams, having all that documented, ready to show, uh, it really, it really helps. And I can, I can say it because it helped me, like even though my small mini games and maybe some blog posts that I wrote, all of that uh, made it wait when, when, when I applied for sure. Cool, that's it. Is there a, is there a Q and A section? Yes, uh, yeah. Yes. We'll stop sharing. Okay um guys cheers so much that was amazing and just to add to everything you guys were saying i'm sure some of you have already put it in the chat but practice makes good remember it doesn't make practice uh, perfect so keep practicing real real hard i'm sure nikki will remember that from back in the day so it's, it's been a minute since i've said that uh, guys thank you so much once again and if there was an opportunity for you to hear everybody applauding um you would be listening to that right now so uh there we go. Fantastic th stuff. Guys, I've got a finite amount of time and I've got a good portion of questions to ask you guys. So let's get some quick fire action going on. And uh, to, just to start off, we're going straight in. So when dev testing for Honor, for for Honor, uh, did you ever have a disagreement with a programmer uh, on the games development team? And if so, how did you both work to find a common ground on it? Ooh, that's a, uh, yeah, it's a good question that, uh, we, yeah, we definitely had a number of, uh, of, um, uh, as, uh, aggressive negotiations, let's say, um, that definitely happens because, because generally, uh, you, you're very passionate about the game. They're very passionate about the game and, uh, you want to, you want the game to be its best. So different opinions will, will definitely clash and you're going to have arguments. It's not all happy faces everywhere. Uh, you are going to have, uh, heavy discussions about it. Um, and only by doing that is really, you're going to be able to resolve it in a sense. You have to, everyone needs, you need to, uh, say what you, think which you think is best of the game they're going to say what they think and then uh, you're going to resolve it like that i know we had something a heavy discussion for uh what was it i think it was multi-monitor support or something oh no aspect ratio we had massive arguments about aspect ratio like how should it work um this game does it one way this game does it another way and it's sometimes i mean it, <laughs> i'm not going to say it turns into a screaming match but it can it like you can definitely potentially get there you like you want to throw things around the room because you're like no it should work like this no it's going to work like this and so, so it's quite a it can get it can get very interesting uh, at times but they do they do resolve themselves naturally over time basically so um so yeah that's very exciting very spicy um on to the next question. So uh, is there any chance that us as students are able to connect with you guys on LinkedIn? Um, as what I've always been told, it's not only about what you know, it's about who you know as well. Uh, that's that's very true. That is very true. Um, I believe, yeah, they can connect to us, yeah, on LinkedIn. Um, I don't know how that's being shared out on your side the LinkedIn or are we just doing shout outs? <laughs> yeah, I think in, in, in truth, Nick, it's, it's um, if students obviously find you on LinkedIn, they can just 
go ahead and add you and are you comfortable with having 5,000 students just adding you <laughs> on LinkedIn? <laughs> uh, yeah, that's perfectly fine. Anyone, uh, anyone can definitely, definitely add me and if they have any questions as well on which they want to send over on LinkedIn, they definitely can and I will, I will do my best to uh, do my best to get to them in due time and answer them. Great. A question for Emmanuel. Um, with Siege, what has been your favorite part in, um, in being involved with it? And uh, just any cool stories from it in general or anything that you just want to mention? Uh, yes. So, um, yeah, something that, that uh, I, I really like from the project, and you can see it especially with uh, this new year that uh, Siege is, is going on, is how there is, a, there is always this big effort of of listening to the players, like being aware that uh, I can tell you that we have a whole department that uh, continuously check social networks. Like we, like I even search Reddit day to day to see if there are bugs, how how the community rep replies to like a certain new thing. Uh, it's cool that after six years, uh, there is still there is still the sentiment of like trying to keep the player at the best experience. Uh, and the whole team is full on 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 the game. So cool stories that I have. Actually, uh, the team is co like the developers are competitive. We have uh, we have like a developer uh, scoreboard, so we can see like we can say uh, we can see who has the best win rate, the headshots, uh, who has won the most matches, and this gets updated every season. Um, I can also tell you that last year we did like a developer championship. So uh, me and some four, uh, like uh, I made a team with my colleagues. We won the Germany Cup, like developer cup. Uh, and then we played with some uh, people, like the other teams from Europe. Uh, sadly, we ended up being like sixth. And I think the ones who won were actually uh, the dev testers, like some of the dev testers. So, you know, they, they continuously play the game day to day. But, but it's really cool. So it's really cool the, the, the love that the team has for the, for the game. Amazing, absolutely amazing. Um, we've got another question, uh, in fact, another two questions for you, Emmanuel. Um, while working on the new Crimson Heist update, is there anything you found particularly enjoyable to develop? And in brackets, spoilers appreciated. Yeah, <laughs> uh, they are appreciated, but uh, definitely not, not allowed. Um, yeah, so uh, soon, yeah, the... the there's a new year for Siege. Uh, I don't know if you saw, like I, I was really cool to just go one day and to work and see there was like a hour and a half YouTube uh, video on YouTube of uh, the new change for, for the year in, in gameplay. And uh, there's going to be cool collaborations with brands. Uh, so yeah, I, I really like the, the things that I've been doing for this year. Sadly, they're still, you know, uh, secret. But, but expect this year to be uh, good for the game. Excellent. Um, as someone who has worked on some of Ubisoft's biggest games as a service projects, uh, what's it like to see them um, pursue those systems in other games such as Watchdog Legions? Hmm. That's, that, that, that's interesting because uh, it's, a, it's a good thing that Ubisoft have like a big uh, triple a games going on and brands and already things that are established uh and definitely games learn from each other uh the success of one can be like learning experiences for for the next one so for example yeah uh, watch those legions of course is it newer than siege uh and there is always this uh flow of ideas so yeah for example Legion can be uh, can learn a lot from like the the same marketing strategies that Siege has on like other projects, uh, but yeah, th there's usually like community like, flow of ideas in tech marketing uh, projects learn from each other definitely. Great. What can you all recommend uh, to the third year students while studying the final year? Is there any particular advice? Um, or things that could increase their chances of getting the Ubisoft internship? Uh, Which internship? <laughs> I'm not sure the student said it, so it could okay. be uh, something they're trying I think, to... I think it depends on, on which internship that you're going for. Sure. Um, I, I, I can't... Well, I'll probably let Emmanuel speak for the 
the more hard skilled ones, but um, definitely if you're going for PR marketing kind of or business uh, roles, uh, they do they do rely a lot on external experience. And I know it's one of those things of like, well, how can I get experience if you don't like, give me a chance? Um, because uh, I, I was in that situation too, and it's basically all the volunteer stuff. Like, I, um, being willing to to spend your time organizing, and it's very hard during COVID, but uh, organizing events, even online, um, doing something like, uh, hey, let's do a you know an event around this particular thing. Let's do it on Zoom, and you being the one organizing that. Um, let's do a charity thing, like on Twitch. Um, you know, it's just being more proactive about um, projects and and topics that are related to your job. So for me, I wanted to do something uh, related to community, to um, communication, to like milling around with other teams, basically. Because um, I know that's definitely a role that's needed. So I just did uh, stuff to help promote that particular skill set of mine. So um, I can only maybe speak for some of the experience of our current interns. Um, for them, uh, they just did a lot of uh, work to build up their portfolio. I think we have a UI uh, intern um, for the clients working with us at the minute. Um, and he, yeah, he basically just, uh, his portfolio consisted of how he envisioned um, the user flow of of um, these game clients, um, and his his vision of like if if there was one game client to rule them all, you know what would it look like and how it, you know uh, how what would the flow would be. So he just took all these ideas and just built up his portfolio um, as on top of you know any other work experience that he was doing uh, before applying for the internship. So it's it's kind of trying to flesh out you as a person um, by just, yeah, just doing a bit more, uh, it's very hard to say that, <laughs> but I can only speak for the experience of, of the current interns now uh, who are going through exactly that. Um, Emmanuel, sorry, you were about to say something. Uh, yeah, so adding, adding to what you said, uh, yeah, like uh, the inter that the good thing about uh, being like a final year student and being and, uh, close to an internship is like you don't have the pressure of like being expected to have so many years of experience and being like a master in this technology or not. Um, the good thing is like, I would say like number one, like attitude, uh, do your research in the company, be it like Ubisoft, be it other one. Uh, game jams and events that a company does are good thing to participate and to interact like uh, i can tell you the last we did in december uh, it was fully online because you know corona so you had an entire discord where us developers like ubisoft employees will be there the whole time you could jump in a chat uh during lunchtime and talk about you know just just about life random topics and you can share your work and of course uh you can know about the opportunities and if it's an internship then at least you have some like i did this or we talk about this uh, but yeah recurring topics of like you know uh, networking and, and and participating in volunteering and so awesome so another one of the questions and and Interestingly enough, in your last responses, guys, you've actually answered some of the other questions that were also asked, which is great. Um, so moving on to uh, looking at something more specific. So when going into junior programming positions, uh, most companies want a knowledge of C++. Have you found that companies offer you training in C++ uh, slash the required language? Um, yes, but... Uh it, exactly. As you said, it's good that you put it into like junior programming. Of course, when you apply to a very specific technical uh, job, you have uh, you have different expectations. Uh, in the case of junior programming, uh, yes, you need to have a, a background in C++, uh, you know, working your way out of the language, uh, producing some kind of like small program. But of course, it is, it is not that you have to master and especially... Uh, C++ is a language that uh, moves every three years as a new release and new features. Uh, but I do can tell you from the Ubisoft point of view, uh, you do get a lot of possibilities of training, of uh, learning, having time to you to build your skills. Uh, 
last year I, I had the opportunity to go to a C++ conference. Of course, it was online, but uh, those opportunities make you to build your your uh, your uh, knowledge. Because of course, I also know I, I also joined the company as a junior programmer. So uh, of course, the company wants you to grow because if you grow, we all like the product grows. So yeah. Excellent. Thank you. Um, Ubisoft Connect has had a massive impact, impact on gaming due to uh, systems like cross-progression across all systems. How is it to know that you've been a part of this system? Uh, I think, well, I know because the transition between from Uplay to Ubisoft Connect was uh, basically really big. Um, I'm trying to think. Uh, Zoe, have you got anything? <laughs> <laughs> How does it feel to, to know that? Okay. Um, well, it's it's hard to 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 sort of gauge any kind of feelings um, because at least for us, we've been sort of working behind the scenes, and so this thing has been going on for so long. Um, that if if anything, and, and for a while, we couldn't even tell a lot of people within Ubisoft that this thing was happening. So a lot of the, so from my memory of it, it was a lot of, uh, hey, we want to get this thing on the client. Ah, we, maybe not now, maybe if you wait, you know, but, you know, because there's something coming. Oh, when's that coming? Well, it's, it, you know, next year. Oh, okay. So, but can we change this feature on the client? Like in the meantime, it's like, ah, but then no. <laughs> there's a lot of um, oomings and ahrings because like I said, a lot of teams want to get something developed and their development time doesn't always line up with, you know, the development time that's going on with, with the client. So I have a completely different feeling about it because it's more of a, oh my God, it's done. <laughs> yay and people like it and, and at least it looks nice um there's a couple of things that um need to be improved uh that's the kind of person i am i always look at like okay we need to do this better we need to do this better we need to do this better so um I, i'm glad so far the impact has been relatively positive um i know it's not uh completely positive uh well perfect uh, especially in terms of the cross-platform uh, tomfoolery and so that's something that needs to be um, worked on again always improving um, yeah so for me I'm just sort of relieved that this, this thing that we've been working on as soon as I joined the team uh, is is finally out and I can move forward with a whole bunch of other features and, and projects that we want to start implementing now uh, things that have been like the community from what I've read has been wanting for a very, very long time. And now we can actually start moving ahead with it. So it's kind of like, yeah, it's it's a, a relief of, I can actually start moving forward with stuff now, yay. <laughs> so um, I don't know if that's the answer you were looking for. That's, that's the one I got. It's a good answer. It's definitely a good answer. Thank you. Um, we're coming close to our final real two questions. And there's loads of questions. I, I have to tell you, there's absolutely lots of questions that have come through. Unfortunately, we haven't got time to answer all of them. Uh, but um, one of the questions is, have you ever had a crunch on a project? And can you describe the experience of that crunch? Uh, we had a, well, I wouldn't say it was a, um, there was a there was a small crunch on for us uh, specifically for the PC side for us. Um, I can only really sort of talk for the PC side because Montre the Montreal side was completely different. Um, they they did have a big big crunch, uh, but the PC side I wouldn't say it had as big of a crunch, but we did have a crunch where we did have to start coming in on weekends and stuff. Um, for for myself, um, I didn't really have. A huge issue with it because I was so into the game like I enjoyed it so much working on the project um, and that I really I just love working on the project so I I didn't care that I had to come in on a Saturday that was actually more fun to me than staying at home and just watching Netflix all day so I actually really enjoy going into work and seeing part of the team again and uh, working together to get uh, to get the project done basically on time um, yeah, I mean, I, there's obviously different stories for crunch where it's absolutely a nightmare, but 
I don't know. Maybe maybe I was lucky, but it was. Uh, I actually really enjoyed it. Yeah, I also um, um, I will give a bad answer, but it's actually a good answer because uh, from the two years that I have been on on Siege, uh, I can I can say that uh, having like a good management and task and having a good uh, schedule of releases help out a lot because I have not yet worked like after working hours or on a Saturday or you know uh, so I I can pretty put all the the kudos to the management team. Amazing. Awesome. Cheers, guys. Thank you. Um, it's always an exciting time talking about crunch and what you want to talk about, what you can't talk about, what you should talk about. But I think in principle, it's, um, it's a really valid and important part of the, of the production process. Um, I think, yeah, literally the last question, I'm trying to cherry pick which one we, uh, which one we use. Um, there's um, one interesting question. Uh, you mentioned ordering merchandise stock to meet demand as being part of the job. Would that include listening to cons uh, consumer demand for potential products that haven't yet been considered and relaying it to the team centered around merchandising? I guess that one's for me. <laughs> um, well, back then, I mean, I, I don't work in consumer products now. Um, I know there is a... A merchandising team for Ubisoft, um, but that's handled uh, in San Francisco and Montreal. Um, but my time at Blizzard, uh, we did used to do um, sort of user research uh, things where we do reach out to like uh, certain gaming communities because you know the WoW community is very different from the Overwatch community. It's different from the Heroes community. So like you know you have to approach them very differently. Um, and yes, you, they pulled in as many ideas as possible. Um, People within the company have their own ideas for products, um, but it's it's sort of an unfortunate thing about a company as big as uh, you know as Blizzard is that there's a lot of red tape. So you know you have an idea, but you have to pitch that idea. Then you have to find out the costs. Um, so even if um, you know there's there's this sort of perception that a lot of people want it. Uh, the risk for them is well, if a lot of people is maybe only five hundred. You know, they, they want numbers that are higher than that because the amount of money it costs to actually get the thing made, um, you know, and shipped everywhere uh, may not necessarily outweigh, you know, what people, you know, consumer um, sort of interest. So, yeah, there's it's sort of that balancing thing. Um, although, like, now uh, the whole merchandise thing is handled by a third party, so I don't know how it's done now. But definitely stuff like uh, taking in fan art, putting on T-shirts, that has always been quite successful. Um, for esports, uh, player jerseys are a big thing because you know that's it's a thing with just all sports in general. Um, but yeah, it's it's not it's something we did do, but it's not as easy to execute, uh, unfortunately. So I think a lot of companies are, are finding that. Sorry. <laughs> I can answer your question in more detail, maybe like another time. No, that's perfect. Yeah. That's absolutely <laughs> perfect. Thank you. Thank you so much. I think there's, there's always the excitement from the audience where, um, and, and from obviously the massive uh, uh, target audience demographic who are always interested in, oh, this is such a cool idea for a hoodie or for a lanyard or for a controller or for literally any other obscure peripheral that they might want to be using for gaming. Uh, it'd be nice to know about those channels and how they could uh, sometimes get their ideas uh, acknowledged. Uh, guys, that is definitely all we have time for from the questions. I just want to use this opportunity to thank you all um, from the bottom of our creative technological hearts. Thank you very much for your, uh, for your responses, for your, your service, your amazingness. Um, and once again, I, I can hear an applause in my ears and probably some people writing asterisk, applause, asterisk. Thank you, guys. So before we wrap up with the talk, guys, um, a couple of little points just to pull out from what our guests were saying. Uh, they mentioned the importance of game jams. Um, interestingly enough, we have a game jam on tomorrow and we have a game jam on Wednesday and Thursday. So get involved. Sign up if you haven't already. It's going to be massive. It's going to be amazing. Lots of comms regarding those game jams are going to be sent out tonight on how to join and how to get involved. Also, there's some mention of and the whisperings of esports. Esports at Confetti, there's going to be a large announcement made later on this week alongside the really, really exciting talks that we've got on associated with esports. So later today, we have Mark Garvey Candela doing a talk on, um, 
on eSports, the growth of eSports, what eSports is. He is the Director of Partnerships um, and Education for Twitch and Amazon. So a real massive, massive talk. Get involved, guys. There's hundreds of activities happening this week, literally hundreds. And we really, really, really are looking forward to you consuming, engaging, and having a great time. Mash that hashtag IW21. A big thanks again, guys. And I will see you in the next talk. Cheers, guys.